Thank God for the old rugged cross. It may be old, but it never gets old. Amen? I'm so thankful that, uh, that because of that, that today we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear what comes after this life. We don't have to fear what happens if we, uh, we were to pass away. And we, we've uh, been to the memorial service. We've done a couple memorial services this week. And we drove to the memorial services. Miss Allie Davis. What a young, beautiful young woman whose life was taken way, way too soon. Just a bright spot in this world. Hard to understand. And then we got to go over to uh, the uh, outpatient therapy department uh, where Carla works and have a memorial service for a lady who was a young lady as well in, in terms of age uh, who was on a dream vacation and her life was gone just like that. And it just goes to show us that none of us know what uh, tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And at the same time, uh, if we know the Lord, we don't have anything to worry about. You know, I don't know for sure that I'll make it home today after church. I don't. You don't. But I don't have to worry, and you don't have to worry either if you know Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the passage is in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. And we're going to kind of take, uh, make our way through there as we're turning there, if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 8. There's several things here that, that he says. But before we start, I want to say today that I do have some bad news that I want to share with you. And the bad news is this, you're never going to be good enough. Just let that sink in for a moment. You're never going to be good enough. I don't care how hard you try, how hard you work, how many hours you put into it, how much you read your Bible, how much you go to church, how much you sing and pray. You're never going to be good enough. But here's the good news. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. Let's look what he says here. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have your Bibles with you and you have them open to that verse, I want you to read verse 1 with me today. Now, our, I don't know what version you have today, so it may sound a little funny. But... I'm reading from uh, the Revised Standard Version. Uh, the Pew Bibles are, are the same thing, but uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, it's a little different reading there. But there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So let's let that sink in for a moment. Let's stop right there and let's just revel in that thought. That's good news. That is something that right now that, you know, if I was a Baptist, I'd probably shout right now. <laughs> I used to be a Baptist, so maybe I can shout anyway. I just, I, I'm telling you what, that's some good stuff right there. That's some stuff that ought to make you happy, that ought to make you feel something deep within. But in order to really understand that and really to appreciate that, you have to back up and read chapter 7. Because in chapter 7, Paul is really expounding on the idea of, I'm never going to be good enough. And he's really saying, if you look at verse 19 of chapter 7, back up just a, a few verses. Paul said, for I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I do. Wow, what a struggle. Paul is saying, I, I, I can't seem to, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm doing the things that I don't want to do. The struggle with the flesh. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Referring to the flesh. And then look what he says in verse 24. Wretched man that I am. 
Who will rescue me from the body of this death? Hear that resounding declaration or this desperation, really, in Paul's voice. Who will rescue me? Who out there can rescue this terrible, sinful person? Well, the good news is we don't have to worry about being rescued. We've already been rescued. And so you move over to chapter 8, verse 1, and he declares with a resounding victory chant, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the idea there is if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Listen to what I said, no condemnation. If you're in Christ, you may say, well, uh, I still live in the flesh. Yes, we do. And the Bible says that we're going to, as if we're living in the spirit, we're going to live by the spirit. And so he gives us a whole list of things that, you know, we've talked about it last week that uh, are of the flesh and things are of the spirit. And it's not just talking about things of the body either. There's spiritual sins such as immorality and all those things. Uh, and even jealousy and envy and hatred, all those things. But the point is that if we are in the Spirit and we're in Christ, that we are not living of the flesh, that it's not about us anymore, as we talked about last time. That now we're wanting to please God and we're living to please God. We don't always make that perfect connection, but we're, we're not living by selfish means anymore. And so he goes on to talk about that. He says, in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So, in other words, when you were not a Christian, you didn't care about pleasing anybody but yourself. You were about number one. I'm going to just worry about myself. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To the set the mind on the flesh is death. I see people all the time who have set their mind on the things of the flesh, and they're dying. Their lives are complete uproar. But he says, but to the set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. But you are not in the flesh, he says. You are in the Spirit. Who will rescue me from the body of this death? Well, thankfully, I don't have to worry about that. That's already been answered. The rescue has already been given on an old, rugged cross. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what the problem is today in, in the church? The problem is that most people don't really believe that verse. I don't think people really believe that. When you share that, when I, when I begin to understand that, it changed my life. It changed other people's life. It changed John Wesley's life. It changed Martin Luther's life when he, uh, in 1510, he was angry at God. Because all he understood about God was that he was an angry God and a hostile God. And, and that we were sinful and that yet God was holding us accountable. And he goes to Rome and walks those holy stairs where supposedly Pilate and Jesus walked those stairs many years before at Pilate's Hall. And he's crawling these stairs and as he takes each step on his knees he is saying the Our Father, the uh, the. Lord's Prayer with each step. And when, before he gets to that last step, he, something according to what he wrote was something hit him. And he heard the voice of God speak to him and say to him, the just shall live by faith. And he stood up and he declared that victory. And that was a truth that changed his life forever. Same thing happened with John Wesley. He was trying to live by the flesh and could not do it until his altars gave experience when he heard Luther's preface being read, the just shall live by faith. It changed his life as well. But I'm afraid that many people don't believe that verse. Most of the people I talk to don't believe that verse. 
I mean, we, we read all the stuff and we quote all the stuff about all the things you got to do, like Samantha was talking about, all the commandments and all the rules and the do's and the don'ts. And, and you know, are there conditions? Well, if you want to live the, Christ, the freedom that he's talking about and live a happy life, trust and obey, yes. But the, but the truth of the matter is, he says here, there's there now for now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So the question is really this. It all comes down to this. Are you in Christ or are you not? If you are, there's no condemnation. You don't have to worry. You don't have to go through life like some people do saying, well, I hope I do enough. I hope I'm enough. You are not enough and you never will be enough. Number one. Number two, you don't have to be. And number three, this is very simple. Number three, the child of God is no longer damned. You don't have to worry about that. I, I'm so thankful today <laughs> that I don't have to worry about trying to be enough, do enough, or trying to, uh, to secure my own salvation. Because the truth is, I would have done messed up a long time ago if it depended on me. I mean, I can't even keep up with my car keys. Uh, yesterday we were going down to the, uh, uh, the um, memorial service. And Bruce needed some shoes, so Sandy and Bruce run into the shoe store. And I had one job to do, and that was to go through uh, Wendy's and get Bruce a little hamburger and, and a meal. And to come back and pick them up. And so I went through Wendy's and, and ordered the meal. And gave her my card and paid for it. She gave me the receipt and I drove off without the food. I got over there at the shoe show and I'm sitting there and thinking, where's the food? It's not in the car. I said, well, I must have not got it. So I had to go back through, drive back through the whole line again. And they're calling saying, where are you? And I'm like, um, that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> and then we get to the uh, memorial service. And after the uh, service, we're uh, Sandy says she's going to use the restroom. And at the MAC, I, I forget that they have the women's on one side, of you, the men's completely on the other side of the building. So we're standing there, and she goes in one door, but they've got two doors. She goes in the left door, and so normally the women's on the left and the men's on the right, right? That's the way it usually works. So I go in the right door, and I meet her going in. I thought, oh my goodness. I'm so glad today that salvation is not dependent on me because I would have done lost it a long time. I'd done messed it up. I'm telling you, I can't keep up with anything. And I am so glad today that it's secure in Christ. Jesus said that you are in my hand and I'm in the Father's hand and no man is able to pluck you out of my hand. It's not dependent on me. I'm never going to be good enough. And when you come to that understanding, when you come to that realization that it's not about you, it's about what He did on the cross, then it'll change your life. It'll free you. It happened to Martin Luther. It changed the rest of his life. It, it changed it so much that he was willing to go against the entire Roman Catholic Church in 157 and post his thesis, 95 thesis to the Wittenberg Chapel in Germany and say, this I believe. It changed him forever and it will change you if you'll let it. And what I'm saying is this, yes, yes, those things are in the Bible to teach us, to follow us. And, you know, I, I expect things of my children. And when you were young, you were expected uh, things of your parents. And as you didn't do them, you get, you'd get time out or worse. Most of us got worse than that. We've gotten away from that. I'm not sure if that's a good thing from, uh, from looking at mo many people in our society today. I think a darn good wacky might be good for them sometimes. And that's not popular, I know. But I'm saying today that, that we've gotten away from that. But here's the thing. Did you ever, ever one time, in all those times that your children disappointed you, when you spanked them or put them a time out or took away something from them, their toys, was there ever a time in that time that you stopped loving them? Anybody? Raise your hand. If there was one time when you stopped loving your children, even though you were angry at them and disappointed in them, 
Not if you're a, any kind of a parent at all. Now you might get angry, but you never stop loving them. If you could just see God, this is what Wesley learned, and this is what he taught. That rather than seeing God as some angry God up there, if you see Him as a loving parent who wants what's best for you, yes, there's consequences for what we do. There's consequences for our actions. But here's the thing, God doesn't stop loving you just because you mess up. You're never going to be good enough. And maybe sometime way back when in our past, there was a, 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 a preacher that white, pointed his finger at us and, and made us believe that this God is up there just waiting to step on us like we step on an ant sometime. But I want you to know what he says here. Listen to it and believe it. There is there now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ today? Are you in Christ today? Then you don't have to go around worrying about, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Have I been enough? And so many people worry about, I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I measure up. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I've done enough good things. I don't know if I've done enough good works. And we're working ourselves to death. And still we don't feel like we qualify. And we don't. We keep missing that mark. The mark of sin. But that's why grace is so important. God takes up where we cannot. And grace comes in. And there's so many people in this life today that I'm telling you that uh, we, we, we want to put them in these categories. And we want to say, this person is a Christian, this person is not. And, and it depends on what we think the sin is for that day. We pick and choose what sins that we can do, and it's okay. And we may be, our sin may be completely different. It may be judgmental. It may be anger. It may be jealousy. It may be all kinds of things. But we sort of skim over that. But then we look at those people and we say, man, now those people can't go to heaven because they do this and this and this, because it's something different. We're like the old preacher that. You know, used to tell people, you know, don't smoke and don't drink and don't chew and don't run around with those who do. And what we end up doing is we end up compartmentalizing sin. You know, we got this big debate today with everything that's going on with human sexuality. And the Methodist church is, uh, you know, like other churches uh, are debating this. And, and the, you know, to me it's a very simple thing. You're either in Christ or you're not. And here's the thing, I don't get to be the judge of that. You don't get to be the judge of that. You don't get to decide who's in Christ or not. God is the judge of that. I might not think that you are worthy of Christ, and you may not think that I am worthy of Christ. But really none of us are worthy of Christ, are we? We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. I'm reminded of a story Tony Campolo preacher told one time, I read somewhere, he received a phone call one day. A man wanted him to do the funeral of a friend who had died. And he said, when's the funeral? And he said, well, it's tomorrow. And he said, okay, it's actually a memorial service. He said, I'll be there. And so he puts on his preacher suit and he goes there. And when he gets there, he's met by about a dozen Men, only men. And he said, uh, as he's talking to them, he said, um, did he have uh, any family? And they said, well, he had some family, but they kind of disowned him a long time ago. And so we're pretty much his family. We've been taking care of him, his friends. And he said, well, how did he die? And he said, well, he died of AIDS. And so Tony said, it kind of dawned on him what was going on at that point. And uh, they began to say, uh, all these men stood there and said, would, how, could you read some scriptures? And he said, be glad to. And he said, how about that scripture in John 3.16? And, and he said, oh, you mean for God so loved the world? And as soon as he got it off his lips, they began to say it with him. And they finished it. 
And then one of them said, how about that scripture in, in John 14 where it says, in my father's house. And, and he began to read that and they finished it. They knew it word for word. And then one of them said, how about that scripture that talks about, and, and, and every scripture that they come up with that he would begin to quote, they would finish. And when they had finished, he said, he asked them a question. He said, let me ask you this. You guys all know the scriptures very well. It's obvious. Where do you all go to church? And at that moment, they kind of dropped their head and nobody said a word. And he said it, it really dawned on him that there he is, he's standing among 12 gay men who knew the scriptures and had brought, brought up, no doubt, in church and knew the scriptures very well. And he said, I've got another verse for you before we f finish and I'm going to pray. He said, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And one of them looked at it and said, you know what, preacher, if I knew of a church, if I knew of a church, I would love to know of a church that would let somebody like me in. The thing is today, I don't think we really believe that verse. I don't really think we believe, we say, oh, it's okay for us. It's true for us, but it's not true for you. Or it's not true for them. And we take the drunkard, or we take the prostitute, or we, whatever. We can just categorize anything, and we say that's not for them. But yes, it is. <laughs> we, we might think that communion is not for them, but it is. It's for all of us, because we're all sinners. I wish we could get that. I wish we could see that there's there now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Yes. Yes, there's conditions. Yes, we, God expects us to accept Him into our hearts and, and ask for forgiveness. And God expects us to try to live the best life that we can. But the truth is, we all fail. And I've just decided, you know what? I'm just going to love everybody and let God be the judge. Because I don't know anybody's heart, really. I don't. And sometimes we get up and we preach funerals and we preach some people in the heaven and some people in the hell and we really don't know. We don't, only God knows our hearts today. Martin Luther found this truth and it changed his life. And if you haven't discovered it yet, it will change your life. You are never going to be good enough, but you don't have to be. And the child of God today, the child of God is no longer damned. Just revel in that for a while this week. Bask in it a little bit and just allow the waters of this truth to wash over your dirty soul. Or maybe your guilty conscience, whatever needs to happen. Let's pray as the musicians come. God, today, I'm thankful today that we have this truth. That Lord, that we know that we can't measure up in this life. But God, you died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And you said that if we believe in him, that we should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I pray, God, that you'd help us to, to grasp this and to praise you for it. And to begin to live for you in freedom, not in fear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.